Hello, my name is Peter Young. Uh, I'm a member of the Committee of 100, and I also run an investment bank, and I want to really welcome you to our 23rd Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings event uh, that is uh, featuring uh, a presentation and fireside chat on the topic of Asian American workers, diverse outcomes and hidden challenges. I'm very, very pleased to have two of the co-authors of a McKinsey report with that title uh, that was just published very recently uh, that goes through a number of very important issues related to uh, what the barriers are and the perceptions of organizations as it relates to uh, career ceilings. Uh, I, I, uh, before we, I introduce them, I just want to uh, say a few things. First of all, uh, the Committee 100 started this, uh, uh, this series about three years ago because we felt that although there are a lot of wonderful organizations who are doing great work in, in this area, Ascend and others, LEAP, uh, we felt that there was a role for a nonprofit organization with no biases to act as a collaborator, but also a convener of bringing experts together, including people from those organizations, uh, together to talk about a variety of different topics. Uh, we've had uh, uh, professors uh, present their research. We've had industry leaders in different sectors, whether it's media or or, or entertainment or legal or others uh, talk about what the unique aspects of this problem are in their organization, in their uh, industry and, how, and their advice. And we've had millennials. We had one where we had four millennials just talk about what it was like as a millennial, uh, you know, their perspective. And then one where we had uh, the parents from a couple of different uh, Asian American ethnicities uh, talk about how you raise your kids and how you have to change uh, the way in which Asian American parents tend to uh, raise and terrorize their kids, right? A lot in terms of careers and so forth. That was, by the way, that was a wonderful one. <laughs> I tell you, I really enjoyed moderating that one. It was just fascinating, right? And and uh, but the whole idea is to bring uh, to the audience uh, a different perspectives uh, as educational. Uh, the last thing I say is now we've started to pivot starting from July of 2021. We've started to pivot towards action items. So we had a group of 120 people get together and say, where are the gaps in 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 the whole process with regard to solving the problem? So we, the idea not to try to duplicate what's already being done well by certain organizations, but to find the areas where uh, you know where where there are gaps, and to try to fill them so that as a collective whole, we can uh, we can do better. And I'll give a good example. There was a feeling there wasn't a common events calendar or a common directory of all the organizations uh, that uh, uh, that that are trying to tackle this. So we created a social media uh, Discord site, which has an events calendar, has a directory, but it also has discussion groups where if you're part of that social media site, uh, you can join a group talking about government or about uh, organizational issues or so forth, but also post articles and things that you think who are, are of interest uh, to the group. Uh, I'll make sure that all of you who are attending today uh, get the link and get invited to that Discord social uh, media site. I'd encourage you to do it. It's 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 great. It's a it's a it's a place where you can post things. If you you know of an event that you think people would be interested in, you can post it. It's a great way for to 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 help people convene. So with that, I'm particularly pleased with uh, our two uh, guest uh, speakers today. Uh, the, the, they are both co-authors of the of McKinsey report that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, McKinsey has uh, been very active in the whole area of diversity, discrimination, et cetera, and very committed to uh, doing the kind of research, but also taking the actions uh, that would help to solve this, what is really a serious problem. It's not a problem for Asian Americans to get into good schools, but once they hit the middle ranks, it's it's a serious problem. And we need to find ways to solve this problem. So the kinds of issues that they're going to talk about is, is it appropriate to lump all Asian Americans together as a group and not distinguish among the ethnicities? Does a model a minority image create problems for, for Asian Americans? Um, is there this perpetual foreign mis, uh, foreigner mis, uh, perception that's uh, contributing to uh, the lack of professional advancement. And, um, and are Asian Americans 
uh, experiencing lower inclusion and getting less support than others, other ethnic groups. And then they'll have some recommendations at the end about uh, things that can be done to you know, help solve the problem. Uh, the two speakers we have today, one is Guilene uh, Lingen Rudd, who is uh, a McKinsey uh, Global Institute Director and a senior partner uh, uh, of the firm. Uh, she has had many different roles, uh, separate from being a successful partner at McKinsey. Uh, this is one area that the Asian American worker issues that she's uh, been involved with the, the work at McKinsey. Uh, and uh, she's uh, uh, had a very successful career focused on uh, financial services uh, for McKinsey. And of course, uh, is has uh, more degrees than uh, one really should have uh, 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 in, in her life. Uh, Jackie Wong is um, leads McKinsey's race in the workplace research. Uh, he His publications, including research on representations and experience in the workplace for Asian Americans. Uh, and he has uh, been uh, very, very active in this area. And you will see that the two little ears that you see uh, that are peeking above the bottom, uh, that uh, is Jackie's dog. Uh, who may or may not contribute to the discussion. We'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. So, with that, uh, in terms of procedurally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to uh, my two uh, panelists. Uh, they have some slides, about ten slides that they want to go through that pull data and observations from their report. Uh, their report is available for those people who want to download it. They can explain how you can get a hold of it. But they're going to go through and try to summarize some of the key points and findings. And being a McKinsey, of course, a lot of it is data driven, which is a good thing. Uh, but they will end up with some conclusions at the end. And that will be about 20 minutes or 25 minutes. And then uh, I'll have a fireside chat with them and ask them some questions. But we're going to make sure that we leave time at the end for questions from those of you who are in the audience. And um, uh, unfortunately, the only way you can ask questions of using Zoom is to type in uh, your question either in the chat box or in the uh, Q&A box. And we're, the, we're all, all three of us are going to be able to see the questions and we'll address them. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Gwilyn and Jackie uh, for, you know, for their uh, presentation on some of their findings. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. I think as uh, Jackie and I embarked on this research, what we knew was that I think what all of us see and experience here in the United States, uh, as you take the majority of the world's population and sort of disseminate that down to one racial group in our workplace, what we see, of course, is there's a lot of diversity within that. What we see in the broader um, workplace is what a lot of Americans see, which is there's a lot of high income, uh, average Asian Americans, uh, educational attainment is high, and economic mobility actually is the highest for Asian Americans of any race within the United States. That's the good news, and that's the headlines, that's the model minority myth that we often hear about. When you parse underneath that, though, when you disaggregate all of that diversity, there's actually a number of challenges. There's pockets of strong poverty. Um, there are other challenges within subgroups. And to take the majority of the world's population and then compress it into this one average is really simplifying a very complex issue. And so we wanted to disaggregate that and really bust some myths. And so as Jackie and I thought about it, we wanted to share with you today five myths that we want to really get deeper into. Uh, and we'll use that as a way to start our conversation in our Q&A. The first myth is that Asian Americans are a homogenous group. I'll go through that. Jackie will talk us through Asian Americans are all doing well, something that you might hear from uh, some of your friends or colleagues. The third myth that we wanna to bust together today is that Asian Americans are paid the same as their peers. They're already doing well, they have high paying jobs and they're paid the same as others. So what's the big deal? The fourth is Asian Americans don't have a problem getting promoted. And the fifth is that they're well integrated in the workplace. And we'll dig underneath each of these in turn. The first one, uh, just to set a little bit of the context for Asian and Asian Americans in the United States, uh, there are about 9 million people, just shy of 9 million. Um, they grew over the last 20 years, almost doubled, um, and they will also double over the next 40 years to almost 9% of the overall population. So moving from 6% today to 9% over the next uh, 40 or so years. 
And as you decompose Asian Americans across the United States, it's about a third, a third, a third, give or take. A third East Asian, about uh, 2 million of which is Chinese, a third Southeast Asian, um, almost 2 million, which is Filipino, and then about a third, 2.4 million South Asian, about 2 million of which is Indian. On the right side, uh, you see about a quarter of, of Asian and Asian Americans are US born. Almost half are foreign born, but are residents of the United States. And then about a third are foreign born and holding a visa. So a much more international uh, global uh, set of diversity than, than in some other racial and ethnic subgroups. Jackie, do you wanna take us over to number two? Yeah, and then um, you know, Quinlan was talking about the the model minority, right? The the whole thing about how all Asian Americans are doing well, and and what we did was we took a look at really where Asian American workers were in terms of occupations and um, and the and the um, and the wages that they were earning, and what we actually see is there there's sort of this U shaped curve where there's a lot of folks who are yes on the on the high earning income side and and with with fairly large uh, representations there, but there's also a lot of folks who are in the lower income wage um, uh, uh, occupations, right? Uh, things like manicurists, pedicurists, um, things like uh, uh, skincare specialists, personal care workers. Um, those types of folks, and, and those are the folks when, when you aggregate everybody and, and say, yeah, all Asian Americans are doing well, those are the folks that fall under the radar, and, and you don't ever then uh, talk about the folks who are not only in, in, uh, in, in occupations that are lower wage, but also occupations um, that are more, especially during this COVID era, right? Essential worker type folks who have been very much um, uh, uh, affected by the pandemic and also have a lot of things that are just, uh, you know, working against them, right? Uh, benefits, uh, things around just the, the, the total experience of what it means to have a job and, and how, how do you actually uh, live, uh, live, and 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 care for yourself and your families um, with 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 that job, and so that leads to um, uh, that kind of occupational clustering, as we as we call it, leads to a great variation in um, the the income and poverty outcomes across these groups. And you see here, right? If 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 it were true that all Asian folks are doing well then we would see median incomes across all of these uh, different groups within within our Asian American population be around the same. And that's not the case, right? You see, um, you, you see the, the, uh, the top here is your, um, your bottom three median income uh, ethnicity groups. And then the, the, the bottom, uh, the, 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 the lower three here are your top three um, by, by, by uh, median income. And you see, uh, folks who are Burmese or Hmong or uh, Nepalese tend to have a much lower average income than folks who are Chinese, Japanese, and Indian, right? And and if you look at the poverty rates, same thing. There's a huge range of this, and it leads to um, the Asian Americans actually within that huge group of Asian Americans having the largest um, uh, income disparity of any race um, group in the entire U.S. And so that's something that is just not talked about um, nearly enough. And, and it leads to folks who are just completely hidden from the whole conversation because the conversation is about how all Asians are doing well. And that's not the case. And the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with here is that even amongst the Chinese folks here, right, the, the, we're, we're talking about um, the third highest median income for, for, for Chinese folks. As Quay was mentioning, the, that group is 2 million people strong, right? The, uh, the workforce in the US. Um, about a third of, of, um, of the full uh, set of folks who are uh, underneath the poverty line within the Asian American community are Chinese. And so even within these 
these ethnicity populations, there is a wide range of, of, of variation in, in, uh, in the outcomes of, of, of these workers. The third insight is around high wage jobs. And as Jackie described, there is a bit of bimodal concentration, right? There's more Asians in low paying jobs and there's more Asians in high paying jobs. In fact, there's about double the share the, of the population in higher paying jobs, jobs that earn more than $100,000 a year. And that's the visible part that, you know, many of our, our um, fellow Americans may see. What they don't see though, is that even in those high paying jobs, even in these jobs, the top 15 occupations we've shown here that make more than 100,000, there is a pay gap. So while white peers would make 100 cents on the dollar, uh, and that would be wage parity, physicists make 66 cents on the dollar if you're Asian, um, Asian American, and there is a greater almost double proportion of the Asian, US, Asian and Asian American US population in physicists. Surgeons make 67 cents on the dollar. Um, actuaries, 87 cents on the dollar, all the way up to pharmacists uh, that make 98 cents on the dollar, but no occupational group across this top 15 actually makes full wage parity. So although there are more Asians in these top earning wage categories or occupations, there's still a pay gap. Uh, and in some cases, a pretty darn significant pay gap, um, 30, right, 34 cents. Um, on the dollar is, is pretty significant, over, over a third in some cases. And so when you take a look at the, the, the actual pipeline um, in, in, in corporate level jobs, and this is, uh, this is research that uh, was derived from McKinsey's Race in the Workplace and Women in the Workplace research that we have. Um, the, it, you you look at this um, this ladder going uh, up from entry level in the corporate um, setting to C-suite executives, um, and the thing that we see immediately is that um, for Asian Americans, there's actually a higher representation of of Asian American folks in these corporate jobs, right? If you if you just disaggregate corporate versus frontline, there's a greater proportion of Asian Americans than representation. In, in corporate jobs, there's a lower representation um, in, in frontline jobs. But even here, and this is very much correlated with the, the, the look that, that Quaylen just talked about of, of wage um, uh, and income disparity, the, the, um, the representation as you move up the ladder uh, becomes lower and lower for both Asian men and Asian women. And it is and the drop in representation that you see here from court, from entry level to the C-suite is actually driven quite a bit by the, the, the decrease of Asian women representation along that pipeline. And so if you disaggregate that, that is a, a big part of, of, of the story here. The thing that we don't have here, and we'll, we've, we've talked about this already, um, is just data, right? And 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 we're able to look at the Asian population as as a whole in the United States in in these formats because companies are um, are, are are collecting data of, along these lines of like whether or not you are an Asian person rather than whether you are disaggregated within that Asian population. And so anecdotally, what we what we know is that within this pipeline, if you separate these by, uh, by East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, the pipelines look very different. Um, the, 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 um, where folks get stuck and, and in general, the, the Asian population sort of gets stuck in this um, senior manager uh, uh, level where then there's a big drop off after that. Um, that changes depending on 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 the the, the the disaggregation of the population that you're looking at, and a lot of that has to do with just the lack of promotion having uh, for for each of these levels going going up. And again, um, it's very much uh, 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 seen in in the Asian women population in the corporate world. And a lot of that also then has to do with sponsorship. And this is something that we talk about a lot in the diversity, equity, and inclusion circles. Sponsorships, if, uh, for those who aren't as familiar with the term, are people who are, um, are actively creating opportunities for people who are more junior than they are. So 
whether it's uh, a direct opportunity like giving them a promotion or something that's an indirect opportunity like uh, putting them in a more challenging project so that they can build their skills or referring them to other people who will also uh, provide them with other opportunities that are beyond their current uh, job description. Um, that's something that we have found and many other uh, 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 research entities have found um, as very important for people's progression along the, the, the corporate pipeline. And what we see here is for uh, entry level and managers, um, the, the effectiveness or the perceived effectiveness of sponsors is fairly similar for both Asian employees and white employees. But then as you move up the ladder, the more senior you get, the more likely it is that, that you as, as somebody who's trying to be sponsored feels that the, the sponsorship that you're getting is less effective than your fellow uh, uh, white employees. And so the, the, the difference between that also is correlated with a, with a huge difference in, in feelings of inclusion within the workplace. And that's something that um, that really, really impacts um, the, the trajectory of Asian American workers in the workplace. And what we often see and hear is um, both women and people of color are over mentored, but under sponsored, right? Lots of advice on how to walk the path, but no sort of sticking out your neck and creating the opportunity for me. And I think we all need a bit more sponsorship rather than just the mentorship. Insight number five, very related to that, is around inclusion. And it's one thing to have the diversity at the table. It's another thing to have the inclusion. And when organizations shift from the diversity to the inclusion, what they find is that they're actually capturing the benefits of that diversity much more deeply. And so the benefits of diversity would be bringing true different thoughts and ways of thinking to problem solving, to a team meeting. Uh, we know that diverse teams both solve tough problems better and are more open to the idea that they didn't get the best solution the first time around. So they're more open to this notion of continuous improvement. So we want both the diversity and the inclusion. What we see here is that Asian and Asian Americans are not feeling as included uh, as their white peers. Um, they are less likely to say that my company recognizes my traditions and habits. Um, they're less likely, especially East Asian, to believe that uh, their company promotes employees based on merit. And when you don't feel like the system is fair, uh, you're much less likely to want to stay at your organization in the medium to long term. You're much less likely to recommend your place of work to friends and family. Um, and you're less likely to be engaged. And at the end of the day, we want engaged employees who are both diverse and feeling included. And so this gap in inclusion, as well as the gap in sponsorship that Jackie was describing, is leading to both, you know, even if you have the diversity, less sort of value from a broader set of ideas and that engagement that we want in the workplace. So those were the top five insights that we thought we would highlight and, and just open it up for questions and discussion. Uh, you, you, why don't you do this? Why don't you go through this last slide, and then and then we'll we'll do a fireside chat, and then we'll open up the questions. There are already some questions in the in the chat box, so we know that. Great. But uh, uh, let's do it that order. And uh, I Wonderful. think these three things about what companies should do are very interesting. So if you could walk through that, that would be great. Okay, we'll we'll hit the highlights, and I think we've touched on a, a couple of these already. I think as Jackie described. If you only have the data at an aggregate level, right, there's only so much that you can say, but somebody who is a second generation, you know, citizen uh, is very different than somebody who's just immigrated uh, and from a, a very different environment. So getting that granular data is critical for us to understand and sort of parse apart some of the challenges that we've been talking about, uh, especially given this represents the majority of the world's talent globally. Um, the second theme is exactly what we were talking about before. We need to address the inclusion challenges. If not only we are able to get our fair share of talent from this highly educated and a highly uh, engaged set of workers uh, in the workplace, uh, and that will help us keep them engaged, but also um, make the most of those opportunities. And then on sponsorship, we have to shift from this, you know, mentorship and uh, trying to get the diversity at the table to true sponsorship and getting pulling that talent all the way through 
to the sort of vice president, senior vice president, all the way to the C-suite, and not just for men, but also Asian American women, where we do see that intersectionality having a disproportionate impact and even greater drop off in that talent pipeline. Well, these are great. Uh, these are great suggestions. Uh, let me, uh, I want to run through a couple of questions uh, for the two of you. You know, first of all, um, you know, we're talking about companies and corporations, you know, we're not talking about government jobs and so forth. And, and it's, it's, what's very interesting is it's obviously a very complicated issue, right? Because everything from social pressures to corporate policies to all these things and racial preferences all, you know, mingled into all there. And so it's very hard to pull them, pull them apart. Uh, but if you think about the companies that seem to have uh, made more progress with regard to helping Asian Americans to succeed in their companies, what are the kinds of things that you think the companies have done uh, to that, that has re have resulted in that? I think I, I can start with this one. Um, just a better understanding of their Asian American population is a huge part of this whole thing. Um, the companies that I have spoken with and 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 work with that have um, that have been able to do the most with this is the is, are the companies who actually understand that there is an issue because they have the data to to, to understand that. Now, whether that data is qualitative data, right? anecdotally um, spoken to them or, or just better better understanding of, of, of people through things like focus groups and such, or it's actually quantitative data that they're collecting, right? I, I know a lot of employee resource groups, uh, or maybe not a lot of them, some employee resource groups um, uh, that, that are Asian focused are starting to really get down to the, the nitty gritty of like, who are the folks who are in, in our employee resource groups? Those are the ones who have a better understanding of the problem itself within their organization and are able to then provide the kinds of tools and resources like sponsorship programs and whatnot that that then can can actually uh, you know fix the problem. So that that is for a lot of corporations and organizations in general, right? Like that is the start that they need. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you you make a very good point uh, in what you just said, but also in the report because. Quite frankly, a lot of companies actually just don't think there's a problem. You know, I've talked to CEOs and they said, oh, really? Is there a problem? And so part of the pro problem is they don't realize there is a problem, right? So your point about data is actually very important because may the data, to the extent that it illuminates uh, that there is a problem, will help because there are just a lot of companies, they don't know there's a problem, right? Quailing, any comment on on this issue of 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 uh, the companies that seem to have been doing better around this issue than others? I think they both understand the problem and at a very granular level. So they will pinpoint where in the talent pipeline uh, different groups are falling off. So East Asian men and women are dropping off at that manager level. What can we do about it? How do we go upstream and understand, you know, where is that kind of pivot point or that that choke point? Um, the second thing is they're also driving this through accountability. They're not asking, you know, what are the initiatives that you're doing? They're holding leaders accountable to improvement, whatever the baseline is, to improvement both by gender and race, and often in that intersectionality. I see the organizations that can improve this for women of color typically tend to improve this both for women and for men of color. And so I think that kind of driving accountability down to the line of business level, down to the function level, and then getting at that intersectionality can help, you know, rising tide can lift quite a bit of boats. Yeah. You know, one way to think about it from a company point of view is that there's sort of at, at least three categories of uh, the, of areas that cause action. Uh, one is outside push. In other words, government regulations, things where they say you must do X or you must have a certain mix on your board, right, uh, uh, by government agencies or 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 um, say you know the SEC, for example. The, the, so that's the outside uh, push. The other is just inherently an organization just believes in it, right? So it's it, it's a internally generated. It's not pushed by anyone. Just the leadership believes that it's the right thing to do. And the other is the push from within. So 
Asian American workers then putting, shall we say, pressure on senior management to be aware of the problem and so forth. So where, you know, when you think about the companies that you are involved with and the, the data that you've gathered, do you, do you feel, which, which of those areas seem to be uh, working or in which areas really there needs to be more energy around in order to cause companies to do the right thing? I've seen recently a bit of momentum on employees speaking up and saying, we wanna see more role models at senior levels and where are they, right? We see a lot of diversity given educational attainment rates and um, you know, sort of both university and master's PhDs. How do we see that progress beyond sort of the entry level or the first couple of levels? I think employee um, pressure and transparency there has helped a lot. I think the other couple of levers and other angles could help even further. Mm -hmm. Jackie, any comment? Yeah, it's like, yeah, I, I was, I was going to say very much the same thing. I mean, the, the, I feel like people don't often see that there's a problem until somebody makes some kind of fuss about it, um, and 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 that has been uh, something that uh, you know more more junior folks these days have been more demanding. And, and there's been some anecdotal, you know, we we're, we we did some uh, interviews and and focus groups around this, but there's just some anecdotal things around uh, the the nature of how folks are culturally brought up and and the the amount of sort of resistance that people are comfortable with in the workplace, right? And so um, that, especially as you know, when I was talking about the the the, the changing shape of immigration to um to the the asian american workforce we are seeing a large proportion of folks who are under 18 who are now going to become part of the the, the workforce who are, are majority u.s born and and that makes a really big difference in in terms of um their own sort of uh understanding of what it means to be fair what it means to um uh, have a, a workplace that is for them and and so on and so forth and 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 that changing um, uh, sentiment has has I think um, really really made a difference in in sort of you know what people are are expecting of their workplaces and of their leaders and there's a lot more people who are just recognizing that oh wow I, I actually don't see that many leaders who look like me in 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 my workplace and so they will ask the question as opposed to um, be okay with the fact that that is the case yeah no i remember you know when i went to investment banking uh after being in strategy consulting and private equity you know there were very few asians in investment banking at the and i was with you know solemn brothers and lean brothers and you know there's th th that's changed gradually but I, I think, you know, although we have a big problem, we also have to realize that pro some progress has been made, but it's been in different categories. For example, when I first applied to college, my alma mater uh, only admitted 15 Asian, Asian, Asians, Asians, period, regardless of whether they're Asian Americans or not, per year for 10 years. And my sister who was, had went to, the, this was Yale, was a year ahead of me, she went to the admissions office and said, it just cannot be that exactly 15 Asians are qualified every year for the last 10 years, right? There's 15 out of 1,200 you know, new students. And they admitted it and it changed. The next year was 30, which meant uh, that allowed me to get in, right? And then and then it's now it's quite different. But so there's progress that's being made in certain areas like the you know entry levels into schools and so forth. But we still have, uh, you know, you know, a ways to go. You know, one of the things also I wanted to ask the two of you is your perspective and your recommendations related to companies, right, and what their practices should be. But the reality is, it has to come also from within. In other words, it, 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 you have to have actions of Asian Americans, and and in fact, some of the handicaps are actually self-created. Right. In terms of, you know, when I grew up, my parents said, well, you know, don't don't be aggressive, you know, just put your head down and work and so forth. And that was at that time was kind of the 
that was the message, right? That that the Asian parents gave to their kids. And uh, but that in fact doesn't work in a lot of Western organizations. So can we talk a little bit about what individuals should do themselves as opposed to, you know, it doesn't mean they can't get companies to make changes that will help, but what can you do as an individual to advance the cause and for your own personal cause, uh, particularly for the people who are attending here, many of whom are probably in their mid careers, trying to decide how they end up at the top. Yeah, a couple of things I think we each could do. Um, one is to raise the question exactly as you're describing, right? It's an uncomfortable thing. You see it, you feel it, and then you decide not to say anything. And how do we each push ourselves a bit more outside our comfort zone to raise the question and, and start the conversation? Uh, that could be in a broader company-wide context on why aren't there more Asian American leaders in this group or that group or this non-IT group, for instance. Um, that could be in a discussion. So when I hear, oh, so-and-so, who happens to be Asian American doesn't fill the room. Okay, well, is that based on your cultural context? What's the actual impact to their work and their results as a result of that? Or is that from a very sort of specific cultural context? Uh, and how do we sort of de-bias some of the conversations and language used to describe um, people with maybe different cultural contexts and, and habits? That would be one thing. So I would say, open your mouth and, and raise the question, sort of force the conversation and be a bit outside your comfort zone. The second thing is we can each mentor and sponsor a few more people maybe outside our immediate sphere, but who are diverse, other Asian, Asian Americans, and we can go out of our way to do that. Um, and I think those connections are even more meaningful. Sometimes they're across organizational boundaries or what, you know, across in a different group. I think those are really meaningful, uh, can be very meaningful relationships. And then third is both to ask for and give direct and tough feedback. What we see is that both women and people of color get less tough feedback um, in their performance reviews, uh, particularly women, but, but women and people of color. And when we ask managers, right, of mixed teams, why is it that you're not giving this feedback? They respond, number one, uh, I don't want to appear mean. And two, I'm afraid of an emotional reaction. But if you compound that across somebody's career, and if I'm not hearing the feedback I need to hear of, Coylan, here's what you need to learn to run the business, I'm not going to be able to learn and grow at the same rate, right, with that same steep learning curve. And so both on your teams, deliver that tough feedback equally across all your team members. And if you are getting feedback, ask for that tough feedback as well. Those would be the three things I would focus on. Jack, any comments about things Asian Americans can do to to help their own cause or the cause of others. Yeah, the 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 one thing I'll add to what Quillen was saying is um, if you are an Asian leader, um, be a sponsor. I think that that is one thing that um, Peter, to your point around like, you know, we we grew up with with certain things that our parents are teaching us, and one of the things I know my parents taught me is that like I am basically out for myself. And like, I need to make sure that the things that I am doing are not um, are, are, are not in conflict uh, with like what is successful for me or whatever it is that 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 uh, that 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 sense that that sentiment is. Um, and oftentimes, for me, at least, that has led to think feelings of like, well, if I help somebody else, is, is that like a zero sum game for me? Right. And, and I think that's something that. Um, again, anecdotally, we've heard from 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 Asian American workers saying just like that's something that inhibited me from being uh, from helping other people, um, and and that that's something that as you're especially as 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 Asian American leaders uh, move up in in the ladder, like that is something that we know um, helping others is 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 something that um, that that folks actually need. You know, the sponsorship element is something that that folks need to to to, um, to move yeah. up just the way that you did. And you actually raised a good point, which which is one of it is do do different eth what ethnic groups actually band together to try to help their their own their own group. And there's a history of that. There's some groups who had serious discrimination early on, like the Jewish community, for example. And yet, at some point, they said, "Let's band together to try to help our community." And they, and they've done a wonderful job of of helping each other, right? By the way, uh, Gwaylin, one of your McKinsey partners, who was a panelist uh, 
uh, during this in, in this series made the following comment said you know the problem with Asian Americans not all of them is they tend to be very loyal to their families but less uh willing to go and help other people who below them whatever and and his his story was he said you know uh certain ethnic groups they'll look at a mountain and they'll say to each other let's help each other and get to the top of the mountain and uh he's he happened to be Chinese American and, and he said well you know Chinese they say well if you ever get to the top of the mountain I'll say hello to you so <laughs> it was a great story well there's a little bit of truth to that it's not true among all Asian groups. I think uh, Indian Americans are better at working together and bring, helping people below. But I think, Jackie, your point is the right one, which is we need to find a way. And partly this program is an example of that. We need to find ways to gather together as a group and try to help the whole group succeed. And uh, unfortunately, Asian Americans, uh, with a few exceptions, are not so good at it, but we need to be good at it because, you know, again, if you don't uh, gather together, try to help each other, uh, it's a lot harder, right, to succeed, right? Uh, so now the good news and the bad news is we have a lot of questions. We have 26 questions. So which, by the way, we normally might have 10 or 15. So uh, So we got a lot of them here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to just walk through uh, some of them. Uh, uh, well, some are really long here. Okay. Well, uh, there was one question, which is whether this these slides would be available. And I think the answer, uh, J uh, Jackie and Quaylin, is actually you can get the whole report, correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So we will we will send to all of you who are attending uh the link so that you can get it from the from the McKinsey uh website so that's the easy question to ask okay uh uh are there here's Jacob Zhang says any corporate leadership development programs for Asian Americans available similar to ELC and HAC are for black and Latinos So, in fact, uh, McKinsey has a Co Connected Leaders Academy that we it actually started as the Black Leadership Academy out of um, uh, uh, a commitment that we made as a firm. Um, and it's since expanded to both Hispanic Latino leaders and Asian American or Asian leaders. Um, and, and also and so it's, uh, there's a there, there's there's a program that is for more kind of executive management folks. And then there's a program that's more for um, you know, uh, up up and coming middle management type folks, and so uh, those programs actually help develop um, people's uh, uh, skill sets in 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 you know in their movement upward, and and you know help help with a lot of those types of uh, of skills that are important for for leadership purposes. So, uh, if you have a, a, a question about that, or if you want more information, just let me know. Um, Jackie underscore Wong at McKinsey.com. Happy to connect you with the right people. And just to add, those are free programs as part of our kind of broader community commitment. So there's no charge for, for any of them. Here's a question uh, from Jim Chang, who says, how receptive have companies been to your report? And are they willing to do something about it? Of course, your report only came out in September. So it's only been a couple of months. But I know you've had other reports that have been released and articles before. Any comment about company reactions to to the reports and studies you've been releasing at McKinsey? Uh, it's been eye opening, I think, for some folks. Um, for for us, and we 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 even had the debate about this within internally when we were starting to write this. Like, but don't we already know this information? It's like, yeah, we 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 sort of do um but also there's like even more data now that we have to be able to validate some of these things for the asian american community uh, that i've interacted with with this report the the report and the findings have been validating and that's that's the case oftentimes for uh, any demographic group who looks at the data and like oh right this is not just me thinking it it's actually born out of the data for organizations that i've talked to um 
many of them are, are literally like, oh, wow, we didn't realize that there was a problem to the point that, Peter, you were making earlier. Um, but two, it's like, okay, well, no, actually, we do know that this, there's a problem. And now we actually have some numbers to be able to prove it to you know some of the leadership. And we also now have some concrete steps that we can take internally to figure out what's going on with, with our own uh, organization. And so, um, I mean, just looking at at our numbers alone on 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 how many people have actually been reading this report, this, this report's actually uh, outperformed um, relative to what we thought it was going to be uh, doing. Because I think there's there, there's a good bit that's resonating with not only Asian American populations but also the DEI community um, as they are looking at you know more equity issues. Because there's a lot of talk, obviously, about um, black workers and Hispanic workers. Um, and there's been less talk about Asian American workers and it seems to kind of go in spikes. Um, and, and we just, we hope that this will continue the conversation. And we also hope that, you know, more organizations will have at least have a look at what the insights are and be able to reflect on um, what's going on in their own four walls. Now, one question from Anthony Tompress. Uh, he says, when you did your survey, uh, did you have a breakdown by immigrants, first generation, second generation? And I guess embedded in that, implied in that question is, did you see any differences uh, as you looked at the, the, that kind of breakdown? Yes. And, these and are really, there's, there's a really a good more... question. <laughs> yeah, they are very good questions. Um, good, good questions from informed readers, I guess. Um, uh, yes, we did. Uh, and, and if you look at the full report, we actually do have more information on that. It is one thing that I think companies um, don't necessarily have uh, a, a good um, handle over. Um, and, and that's something that, that you know, we, we actually hope to do a little bit more follow up on the immigration piece. Um, our, our immigration numbers were similar to what the overall immigration numbers were in the US. I think it was more like 60, 40 in terms of um, folks who were US born versus foreign born, as opposed to in the wider US, which was 25% and 75%-ish. Um, but we, we did see uh, in general that if you did the intersection of immigration, um, there, in, in that sense, immigrants versus non-immigrants. If you if you did that intersection, that uh, that immigrant populations tend to have a lower uh, level of inclusion overall, and then lower levels of inclusion in very specific areas um, that that are that are different than um, uh, than than non-immigrants. By the way, in terms of your data, one of the things I did notice is when you were comparing. South Asians and and Chinese and East Asian and so forth, the and whites, the perception of uh, Indian Americans, or, you know, the South Asians was that they, they they didn't perceive as big a problem as the rest. And by the way, uh, in at least two of the uh, events we've had, we've had researchers who presented report reports that said that Indian Americans did better than other. Uh, you know, other Asian Americans and why. It's a bit controversial. Not everyone agrees with their research, but it was very interesting to see that your data also suggested that they perceived that they have a problem, but not as big a problem as other uh, you know, Asians. Is that reflected in, in the other parts of the study at all? Or I know that was clear in that, in that one chart. Yeah, I think that's true around uh, feelings of inclusion, feelings of fairness, um, but also representation in sort of higher paying in, you know, occupational categories and some of the other charts. So I, I think it bears out actually in a couple of different aspects of the data. By the way, Gwendolyn, I'm very, very appreciative of one of your charts where you looked at the, the high paying job, the disparity. Uh, my, I originally was a physics major at Yale. <laughs> and, uh, and it had the highest discount. It was like at 66 versus 100. Yes. So I'm very appreciative that vindicated my move to finance. I, <laughs> I, now, I feel particularly vindicated about my decision to change my major to economics, right? Uh, so uh, one question, and it, it's about McKinsey, but also what it's doing to the outside world, but also internally. And this is Michelle Lee. Is 
you know, what is McKinsey doing to resolve the issues of lack of promotion, unequal pay for a, 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 AAPIs? And I, I think I'll broaden it to say not only well, to the outside world, but but within McKinsey itself, right? Because obviously you're a large company and you have to deal with this issue as well. So Graylin, you want to answer that question? Absolutely. I think externally, um, Jackie described some of the things in terms of creating the research, sharing the insights, but also talking with organizations about what they are doing and, and could do more of uh, in a faster, edgier way. Internally, and Jackie and I are involved in uh, a number of these efforts. Um, one, we, we do look at the pay gap uh, by gender and race. It's less um, obvious there because typically a certain level and a certain and performance rating by definition gets you a certain pay. So it's less, uh, I think, of an issue there. And it's much more around diversity and then promotion rates. And what we've done is disaggregated by Asian subgroup, as our recommendations would suggest, um, where the choke points are in that talent pipeline. And that looks very different, for example, for um, East Asian men versus East Asian women. Uh, and where do we lose that talent uh, specifically, and what can we do about it to kind of both retain, deepen connections and sponsorship gaps um, and get over that sort of promotion hurdle uh, in certain key parts of the talent pipeline. So we're better able now, I think, to pinpoint where the challenges are, look deeper into kind of white space for sponsorship gaps, and then basically set an expectation for stronger, deeper sponsorship um, not just across Asian Americans, but uh, across our white colleagues and, and other colleagues as well to kind of fill some of those gaps. Yeah, yeah. We, we asked the same question of the, the, the CEO of Hydric and Struggles, where they're in, a, they're in a particularly good position to have an influence. And he said, uh, and by the way, he's Indian American, which he's the first Asian American to mm -hmm. be head of Hydric and Struggles. And he mm -hmm. said, within the bounds of, you know, reasonable behavior that they really try to influence their clients in terms of the decisions they make about who to bring on boards and who who to promote as CEO and so forth. And you know, so and McKinsey has a role because it's advising senior management and companies around the world. You have an ability on the increment to have an impact that's very positive, right? Um, there's a question from Julie Huang. So, and this is focused on Asian American women, right? Because you can clearly, clearly see there's a there's also a, a gap, a particular gap between male and female. How much of the lack of Asian American women in senior leadership roles is due to social pressures of being caretakers from families or, or versus not having sponsors or not feeling they belong in these roles or something else? Uh, are there any insights as to why Asian American see, uh, women seem to not do as well as Asian American men. Yeah, it's a challenge. We have not kind of perfectly parsed apart what is sort of the social challenges and pressures versus uh, other challenges. I will say that intersectionality of lack of Asian uh, and Asian American women at the most senior levels is true across Black women, Latino women, and beyond. Um, so it's not unique there. It seems to be that intersection of when you are both a woman and a woman of color, it's just extremely, extremely hard to reach the C-suite. So about one out of four people who report to a CEO across U.S. companies is a woman. One out of 25 is either an Asian, Black, or Latina woman all added together. So it's not just an Asian American woman issue. It's a woman of color issue more broadly. Um, I would say it's probably exacerbated by a lot of the social pressures, not just the caretaker pressure. And in the United States, women do about two, two and a half times as much unpaid care work as men, which is taking care of parents, in-laws, children, cooking, cleaning, et cetera. Um, and so that average certainly doesn't help. Um, but there's also the greater social pressure of what are the expectations of an Asian American woman in society in terms of having a strong opinion, raising your voice, you know, sort of showing your leadership. And this notion, this societally ingrained notion that leadership looks often white, male, often tall, right? And so when you ask people to even kind of look at an exactly identical resume, and one is a John Doe versus Jane Doe, and those bullet points, the font size, everything is identical, both men and women will say, I think this male leader, this imaginary male leader 
is a better leader and I see higher future potential. And so we've got this sort of ingrained notions of, of leadership that are both by gender and race uh, are challenging, I think, for Asian and Asian American women, unfortunately. So Michelle Lee has a question. She says, how effective do you think lawsuits of racial uh, related to racial and sex discrimination can drive change? I think it's a good question and broaden it to not just legal suits, but you know, legislative and other actions, right, as well, mm -hmm. right? It's going through the government or the legal process. Uh, any comments? I like that as an option. Jackie would love, love to hear any of your thoughts, right? So when California says across the board, right, here's, here's the new law. Uh, uh, we see this globally with quotas oftentimes. Uh, quotas do move move the needle and they move it much more quickly than often other things would have moved otherwise. So I think legislative action, uh, laws changing, moves things pretty much as quickly as we have seen, especially in elements of diversity and inclusion. Uh, on the lawsuit side, you know, EEOC, other sort of levers, if you will, um, that would probably be not quite as quick as sort of the legislative action or the laws changing, but probably, you know, faster than uh, not and, and sort of moving in that same direction. Yeah, actually, uh, in terms of the EEOC, Cynthia Tsai, who is the general counsel of the Committee 100 and, uh, and I have been talking to the some of the senior directors at the EEOC and, and, and <clears throat> asked them if they could share two things. One, the data that they have, because they have tremendous data on this issue of discrimination in the workplace, but also what are the tools available mm. to Asian Americans if they feel they've been discriminated uh, in the workplace? So we're trying to work with them to see whether they could be part of a webcast and help educate uh, you, know, our, our, you know, our attendees on what tool, legal tools are available for you to ma make sure that you, uh, you know, uh, assert your rights. So- um, Peter, Peter, yeah. on the on on the on the topic of EEOC, I, I'll, I'll say if, if you get a chance to try to convince them to ask the question of East Asian, South Asian, South East Asian, that would be tremendously helpful because literally, you know, as maybe a lot of folks know, um, almost all large companies submit EEOC data on a yearly basis, and that's that's split by race. And the way that companies ask their employees to self-identify is very often along the lines of that EEOC data because they have to submit it. Yep. And so if, 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 if there is literally the forcing mechanism for them to, to, be, to, to have that, uh, that additional layer of, of, of whether you are an East Asian or Southeast Asian or a South Asian person, that changes the game quite a bit um, in terms of what companies actually are, are collecting in terms of data. Yeah, and and that's yeah, I commend Cindy Zai for her reaching out to EOC and say, let's have a dialogue. And uh, and then of course, she then pulled me in, which I was very happy to do. And so we, we are gonna pursue that because we do think that's an important way to help Asian Americans understand uh, what rights they have, but also what the EEOC uh, can do that will, to help to help this uh, the issue. Now we pride ourselves on starting on time and ending on time. Uh, I'm going to blame our two panelists for the fact that we have 27 questions and only answered about eight of them. And I apologize to those of you who asked questions that we didn't answer. Uh, but I do have a potential fix. I'm going to surprise the two panelists here. Uh, one of the things that we are going to be doing are a series of town halls uh, where it's going to be less speeches, but more giving people the opportunity to really discuss and, you know, in groups. And we're thinking of starting that a series around a couple of the key areas, such as corporate advancement, uh, you know, the, et cetera. And it's almost certain we'll do one on this issue of corporate and organizational advancement. And so I hope to have Guiling and Jackie join as sort of discussion leaders uh, we have a technology platform we're going to that we I have been using, which allows people to, you know, uh, go from table to table and really talk to the people at the table. So uh, now I uh, I put pressure on the two of you to say yes, but we'll try to arrange a time where we get a group of maybe four to six uh, opinion leaders, uh, and then invite attendees to come and really. 
the focus is going to be having an open discussion and not only about what, what the problem is, but also to think about how do we galvanize around, uh, around solutions. So with that, I really, first of all, I want to thank the audience. We had a really good audience here and, uh, and asked lots of really good questions. Uh, and I want to thank Guiling and Jackie for really uh, sharing with us uh, the, the, the key points from, uh, from your report, and, uh, but also for McKinsey, because they've been a good uh, partner with us. They, they, they partnered on some various things, and we're going to be partnering uh, in an in-person meeting uh, sometime in the spring, where we're going to try to gather people together to talk about the issue and focus on solutions, right? Because at the end of the day, you can. it is very important uh, to talk about what the data is and, and define the problem. But if you don't go on to say, how do we solve the problem? It's nice, but it's much less uh, uh, effective. And so we're going to start to develop more of our energy on. And, and we hope that a, lo a, lo a lot of you who are attendees will be part of working groups to try to solve specific uh, uh, problems. So with that, thank you very much, uh, Guilin and, and, and Jackie. I know, Guilin, uh, I think you're in Shanghai. Is that right, right now? Yes. Okay, yes. so we know that we know that it's rather late where you are. Uh, so we appreciate the fact that you're, uh, that you that you participated there this time. And thank you, Jackie, uh, as well. And uh, we're just, uh, uh, we, but you promised that your dog was going to present some PowerPoint slides and <laughs> you obviously have fall down on the job, right? Yeah, I think he ended up going and, and, and playing with something else instead, so that's, that's <laughs> You found something more interesting to do, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you very much and thank you all and uh, for, for join, uh, joining us and uh, uh, we wish you all a happy holiday season coming up.